Welcome to Charm Conversations, an interview series that focuses on meeting some of the individuals in the hypnosis community and finding out a little bit more about them. I'm Sai. I'm going to be your host through these conversations, and I've had the benefit of meeting quite a few interesting individuals, both stateside and internationally, who I felt were great individuals to speak about what they see in the community, what got them started in hypnosis, and why they're here. So let's take a few minutes, talk to each one of them, get an idea about where they see the community going, where it's been, how they got started in hypnosis, and how they're just like the rest of us, looking for an interesting time and figuring out the human mind. My next interview is with Imaginatrix Hypnohedonista. She's an active personality on Twitter, a person who spends a lot of time thinking about hypnosis and how to use it, and a hypnodom with a rather loyal following. I will add that this is probably one of the spicier interviews I've done to date, but man was it fun. Here she is, Imaginatrix Hypno Hedonista. Mm-hmm. Let's go ahead and talk about you because that's why we're here. Um, who are you and what's your quote unquote resume as part of the hypnosis community? How'd you get started? How do you how do you involve yourself in the community? So many questions. Yeah. Okay. I'm excited. Um, I am Imaginatrix Hypno Hedonista. Um, I'm a pro hypnodom or pro hypno switch i suppose technically trance slut is how i like to describe myself a hypnotic hedonist and how do i get involved in the community well i make quite a lot of content i have an only fans i have lots of people that i do fun hypnotic things with and i am a hypno kinkster as well so i am constantly doing hypnosis all the time and it's the best thing ever which is <laughs> such a great thing to fall into. And if I remember correctly, this is something that you just started recently, right? Was it this last year? Yeah, just a year. Actually, it's coming up to my anniversary of the first time that I dropped someone. So, oh. And the first time that I was entranced was last year in October. So yeah, about this time last year, I discovered hypnosis and how awesome it is. <laughs> so happy hypno anniversary almost. Thank you. Yeah, it's been an absolute roller coaster. It's been wonderful. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the fun things that I learned about this community also is that it's a lot of interesting people, everybody coming from different places, different spaces, and everybody just having a fun time. So, Oh, for sure. I mean, the the speed at which I've learned is because I've played with so many amazing hypnotists, and I have a quite good memory for for words anyway. So I think most of my learning, at least especially for the first maybe six months of getting into hypnosis, was all passive just by enjoying being hypnotized by people. And then I started to get a bit more technical with it and sort of break down other people's scripts or, you know, look at what I was doing and then iterate and things like that. But honestly, a lot of the learning has just been by having fun with it with people, <laughs> which is amazing. What Practical can you ask? experience is the best teacher. For I really sure. remember sure. that. <laughs> so what got you interested in hypnosis in the first place? Mm, so it was actually Sinister, Sinister Denial, who got me into hypnosis because we were already doing other BDSM things together. And I was already in my local uh, kink scene generally. And he, I heard he did hypnosis and I was very, very interested. So I asked him to trance me. And from that moment, that first trance, I was smitten. And it was about five days later that I was like, oh, you're going to have to give me some resources or point me in the right direction because I need to learn how to do this. And then uh, from then on, it was just uh, it's an instant obsession, I would say. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. I think some mm-hmm. of us are wired to under want to understand things. And the human mind is such a puzzle. There's so much to learn about mm-hmm. it. There's so many different people out there and so many different ways to drop them and do mm-hmm. interesting things with them. Mm, for sure. And I got a lot of the community to thank because just soon after my first experience and the first time I dropped someone was Sinister, he he offered to practice with me. We went to uh, the UK Recreational Hypnosis Convention and there was speed trancing and there was so many really experienced subjects who could give me critical feedback. And I managed to get, because I think the hardest part really of getting into hypnotizing people is just getting that confidence. Because I remember really strongly at the start feeling like I was taking on this like big magic power that shouldn't be mine and that it was so impossible to imagine that I could do it. 
just by speaking, I could make things happen. But after that convention, everything changed because I realized it is just talking to people and they you kind of invite them and you collaborate and you share this experience. And actually, so long as the will of the subject is there and the subject wants to relax and you have that trust and rapport, then not that it doesn't matter what you say, but you could say a lot of different things and have the same effect. And there's so many ways someone can go into trance. And I think after that point, after that experience, I was just so much more confident to go forward and, and pursue it. Mm. You know, there's a mind joke I would make, which would be, you know, get out of my head, because I'm in that same place myself where it, it, it's, it's scary. You know, the first convention I went to, it was all about learning how to be hypnotized. And because there's mm. not really a local community in my area, it makes it difficult to learn how to do that. But you're right. It is, it's this big, scary power that everybody thinks is, oh, you have to do it perfectly. And really, that's not it at all. Um, there's just opportunity to have a conversation as long as both sides have a good rapport and there's an interest, you're going to succeed. And that's sure. kind of the point of being a hypnotist is that just remember that your goal is to hypnotize the other person. Their goal is to be hypnotized. As long as you're both on the same page, you're going to make magic happen. Exactly. I mean, and I think, you know, learning kind of kinesthetic techniques and things like that that actually remove a lot of the need to say a lot of things at the start can be really helpful. And just um, being in a room full of people that you can really sense the will of them, of everyone there to drop, like everyone wants to drop. And uh, being in that kind of con environment where everyone's kind of fractionated mm -hmm. and, you know, the merest sort of side glance sends someone cascading into a deep trance, not a deep, you know what I mean. Yeah. Is just, it's very it unlocks a lot of things, a lot of that, like, because you can rationally understand that, of course, someone will just go into trance if they want to, mm -hmm. but you can kind of feel almost scrutinized or a bit embarrassed or self-conscious when you're trying to use the words that you've heard other people use. Right. And you have a subject in front of you that's expecting something. But if you realize that actually their expectations, they're on your team, they're not testing you. They're just wanting to go into trance and they, yeah. they've they chosen you to be the vehicle to take them there. And that in itself is amazing. And I think a con can be really helpful. And just to see so many different techniques and hear so many different styles, right? It's amazing. It's good. Yeah, I was uh, laughing with a friend of mine because uh, Mind the Baron it was an individual that I met at Charmed uh, 2020 in person. And I, I was kind of gushing a little bit, and she laughed because, like, I really want to talk to this guy and understand more because he got me to understand that hair pull induction is not just for people who have a lot of hair. That man is clean crop <laughs> on the top, and he gets dropped with a hair pull induction by holding the back of his skull. He gave me hope because <laughs> nobody can really see me here in person. But I, I have that genetic predisposition where I don't have a ton of hair on the top of my head. It makes me feel included, and, and that's a good thing. You know, oh, let... of all types is good for everybody. That's it, exactly. Like, how long might it have taken? How much fun might you have missed out on if you hadn't have seen that, like, little bit of talk, that little bit of information? Um, it's just, and it keeps ideas flowing around, you know? Like, that's right. the hardest thing when you become someone maybe who steps past just that initial kind of skill okay you, you know how to hypnotize people now you feel quite comfortable you've got a bit of patter what the heck can you do with it like how do you keep it fresh how do you keep you know keep finding new weird things to do with people's minds that's the that's the next goal right that and then somewhere like a convention where you can share so many different ideas for how to like influence people and use them for decadent ends like that's what you need you need a community of people doing the same thing as you so that you don't feel alone and so you keep yourself creatively stimulated god i need that so much honestly uh yeah i think you just hit on something i didn't even realize myself so yeah no i, I completely get where you're coming from on that because that's that's the struggle that i've had is because there's not really a community around is 
you know, hypnosis is something you, you enjoy, but regular life kind of gets in the way of it sometimes and you forget why you are impassioned by it. And then all of a mm. sudden you get dropped and it's like, oh, that's why. Or you see somebody drop, and you're like, oh, that's why. There needs to be that little bit of balance. But that's exactly it. It comes down to finding those opportunities to learn new ways and new information and honestly, new kinks. I had oh, no yeah. idea about some of the the things that existed. You'd see them as words on a page, but you wouldn't understand what they were or how they could make you feel until somebody goes... So you want to try this? Sure. And all of a sudden you're trying you're like, oh, I had no idea. And your mind is alight with all the possibilities. So mm. Mm. Something I think about a lot. Me. Something I think about a lot with that is, you know, we kind of use these words like, I don't know, bimbofication. Mm -hmm. Like that's a huge area. And there's so many ways you can be a bimbo or make someone into a bimbo or a drone or you know, you can make someone, you could feminize someone or whatever the kink is. There's so many different ways into it. And I think without seeing how other people do exploring those particular fetishes or those particular mm -hmm. kinks, you miss out on a lot of potential because you have the things that come to your mind straight away. It's like, oh, that means that to me, but it can mean something else. You just have to find a different angle that, to explore it from and a, do, a new way into it and new things that you can do while you're in that space. And I think that that makes the fun of exploring all these fetishes so much more, ah, so much more rich. It's just, there's so many ways to be a bimbo, you know? It's a glorious thing. It's a beautiful world. So many kinds of bimbos running around. Absolutely. And there can be so many more. We just need to find out what kind of bimbos we can make, you know? It's like Baskin Robbins or you know, any kind of ice cream shop. There's plenty of flavors. Just find the one that you like and maybe try another one every once in a while. See if you like it too. Mm, well, yeah. yeah. But it's like, you know, okay, you like strawberry. Well, here's like 16 different strawberry ice creams. Which do you like the best? They're all strawberry, but they all taste kind of different. You know? Mm -hmm. What brand do you want to lick? <laughs> I'm not saying that that went a little couple of places probably for some people, but my brain went somewhere else. <clears throat> well, that's terrible. You yes. should be ashamed of yourself, sir. Yes, the enabler from the other side of the, the, the pond. Uh -huh. Thanks for that. <laughs> so as, getting back on track, because we okay. can do this all day. Uh What's a bit of advice you'd give to someone who's just starting out in the hypnosis world? As somebody who just recently got into it yourself, what's something that you feel was a piece of advice that would have helped either encourage you or ground you or just reassure you back when you first started getting into hypnosis? I think the it's just speaking and that makes things happen is important. Like you're not taking on this great unknown power it is for you it's for everyone everyone who wants to play with this once they've got a basic understanding of the ethics you are literally just talking and you're you can just talk like you've heard everyone else kind of talk and you will put someone into trance if they want to go into trance there's nothing special or magnificent about hypnotic speech it's just talking, <laughs> which this is just, I know that sounds like it's a given, but I definitely felt that at the start that I was somehow not allowed to do it or that I was trying to be something that I couldn't be. I mean, honestly, that feeling didn't persist very long, evidently, but I definitely felt like I was trying to use this magical power that wasn't mine, but it is yours. All you need to do is start speaking All it and it will seed. happen. That, that little seed of knowledge at the very beginning of uh, honestly finding your trance, understanding that it is something that you can do and that you enjoy. And mm -hmm. after that, it comes down to just, like you said, speaking. I was just laughing because I had a thought that how many times of us have most of us been in a classroom, whether it be college or high school, and you have a teacher who is just droning on in this absolutely monotone <laughs> voice. And you have no idea why they're talking like this. And you want to go to sleep in the first place. 
So really, <laughs> the power is for everybody, and teachers should be more mindful of how they use it. Mm, for sure. I mean, exactly. I think people feel like they have to, and the same with dominance, to be honest. And I'm doing a talk about this soon. Maybe I'll bring it to Charmed, who knows? But Ooh, the idea that you do. have to be any one thing to be a dominant you have to be any one thing to be a hypnotist you don't you just be you doing hypnosis you just be you doing whatever you feel like doing that you've agreed to do in the scene with a submissive mm. it, there's no one thing or one way to approach this and if you are parroting someone at the start or if you're doing things that make you feel confident at the start if you're even going by scripts at the start, then that's okay. Like it's it's okay to start. You have to start somewhere. No one expects you to be the most proficient, talented, you know, eloquent hypnotist that's ever existed on your first trance. No one expects that. <laughs> Take the pressure off yourself and just enjoy the connection. Because if you're connecting with people and it's feeling good, then that's half the battle is done for you. If you're having a good time and it's relaxing, that's what it should be. It shouldn't be a test. It shouldn't be something pressured. It's just... So I'd say that the most important thing to find at the start is someone that you feel comfortable with, that you have a good relationship with in the first place that you can explore these things with. Once you have that, once you have someone who you know isn't judging you and isn't treating you like a kink dispenser and isn't expecting of you something that you can't deliver then you can have fun with it which is kind of what it's about <laughs> yes everybody who's listening to this remember hypnotists are not trans dispensers treat them like human beings because <laughs> just like you they get to enjoy this so don't just be like hey trans me you know that that's not fair you don't walk up to a comedian and be like tell me a joke it's not the way <laughs> this works and you know the other way around if you're a hypnotist you know you don't have to always be switched on if you don't feel like it. You give yourself the best chance by, you know, enjoying the process instead of seeing it as something that is like a difficult, like a test. I think some people yeah. feel like they're being tested when they trans people, which is really no fun. Um, whereas if we all take a bit more of a playful approach, if we all just remember that we're we're in it to have fun, to have a good time, to feel good, we're in it for the pleasure. Pleasure. <laughs> then we're having a good time. And you'll probably have a better chance of going deeper and all that stuff too. That's, that's my hedonistic uh, cup of tea. And she literally drinks from a cup of tea. <laughs> so, that being said, which is wonderful advice, thank you. Um, what's one rumor that you hear happening either in the community or with people in general that you would love to dispel about hypnosis? A rumor. Or just a, a belief, something that you feel uh, people That have. should be challenged. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Um, it's not magic. Hypnosis isn't magic. This is something that I get quite a lot from people who approach me for sessions, especially if they're newer to the community i think a lot of people because there is such wonderful mind control fiction out there isn't there there's so many depictions and archetypes of people being completely disowned of any um any will of their own any choice of their own and that's the ballpark that we play in that's the structure and the framing that hypno kink often uses but it's not magic i'm not doing magic and so there's always going to be especially at the start a sense that you're kind of involved in doing it because you are <laughs> because you are moving your body still and it can feel a lot like you're not moving your body but actually you are moving your body <laughs> I'm not actually inside of your head although it feels like I am and so some people get so lost in this fantasy of what hypnosis can be that they forget that it it is a legitimate process. It can make you feel so many wonderful feelings. It can make you feel very, you know, detached or it can make you feel very sensitive or it can, you know, there's so many things it can do, but you are a collaborator in that. I'm not actually able to control your mind or read your mind for that matter. I have to get you to talk so that I can understand what you're doing and thinking, even though I'm a really good reader of bodies and, you know, facial expressions and micro expressions. I still need you to discuss with me what went well and what didn't. 
So I think if we can take a more pragmatic approach sometimes to say, this is something fun that we're both engaging in, that we're suspending that belief for a while that you have control, but we are ultimately having fun. It comes back to that playfulness again. And I think if people didn't have this preconception that hypnosis is magic, then they would have an easier time going into trance and they would enjoy the suggestions that they're following more because they wouldn't have this feeling that they're not doing enough. They're not, they're not experiencing enough helplessness or whatever they have in their head that they feel like hypnosis should feel like because they feel like it should be this completely out of body, total control. And so that then they can't enjoy what is happening to them, whatever that is. So I think expectation should be left at the door so that you can just enjoy whatever is happening. What do you think about that, Sai? No, I think that's fair. Um, rephrasing that i think that is absolutely a, a wonderful point because when i first started i think that was the same belief that i had wrapped up in my mind your thought process of well my arm should move because they said it should move right or i should stay put because they told me i should stay put i'm an individual who has that little voice in the back of his head as we all normally do that's just evaluating everything that's going on and it's looking at my body when you're going, oh, well, go ahead and move your arm. My arm's not moving. Should my arm be moving? Why isn't it moving? And you, you kind of break things down, and that's not necessarily the focus point you should be having. The conversational focus point is, like you said, you're a collaborator. You are never going to feel, hopefully, the sense that your body is completely alien unless you're really, really trying at it. And your body's involved in this. Moving your hand because the person on the other side of the trance is saying, your hand wants to move upward, doesn't it? And doing it is part of the experience in the first place. It's whenever you kind of do that disconnect. And that's always the hardest part for me is the disconnecting the belief that my body should be doing things automatically from the voice that I have in my head. That was a part that, that threw me for the longest time. But as time has gone on i've been able to do more and more like the ability to speak in trance which at the very beginning all i really had the ability to do was not a lot but <laughs> eventually you you find those column controls again in your own body to be able to move things and they're a little bit different they feel different from your everyday movement or your everyday talking mm -hmm. But they are there, and you are supposed to engage on them. It is not something, like you said, that they are going to have 100% control over your body mm -hmm. to mystically and magically move your arms behind your back or behind your head or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you know, I and think I, that's a valuable piece of advice. And it's that framing, isn't it? Uh, and this is, I think I have Sleeping Girl and Cece to thank for their talking about framing. You know, saying that, oh, well, my arm did feel like moving upward. And knowing that, like, okay, I probably could have held it downward if I, I could have not raised it if I really right. wanted to not raise it I could have left it there but it did want to move upward and so I felt hypnotized you know what I mean and then you're going like well that was a fun hypnotic feeling that I had in another headspace you could have sat there and you like you say you could have been like well I can not move my hand up so if I leave it there you know then if I can leave it there if I can choose to leave it there then I'm obviously not hypnotized and that would be, you know, a legitimate thing to think, but what would it achieve? Like, what right. are you getting from that? If your hand wanted to move up even a little bit, and then you went, oh, it does want to move up a little bit. I could just let it move up a little bit. Oh, it's still, it wants to carry on moving up. Then you're getting to the point feeling like, oh, my hand does want to move up. I am hypnotized, which is just a way funner headspace to be in. <laughs> and I feel like if people went in, I think something that made me successful as a subject from almost the very start was that I was very willing to kind of be like, I feel this happening in me mm -hmm. and I'm not going to reason with that. And I'm not going to try and not feel like that. I'm just going to go with it. Um, and I don't know if it's because I did kind of amdram. I was a drama kid in school and I'm very used to just being stepping into a headspace where I kind of believe for a bit the things that I'm acting. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was a pretty okay actor. I played the lion in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe one time. Ooh. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, no, 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 it wasn't Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It was um, Wizard of Oz, which is a very different lion. But yes, that would be a very different lion. Still, like, not in the title, but still a very important character, I think you'll find. Absolutely. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes, Gotta exactly. find your courage. <laughs> it found me. Um... So I don't know if that kind of helped just being able to throw away kind of like I can just be in this in the moment and not really worry about not doing this because this feels like a lot of fun to do. So I'm just going to do that. And then once you built up that sense of like, oh, this is really happening to me, then you can invest belief in it. And then once you invest belief in it, you really very quickly do feel like those things are not in your control anymore. Um, or at least, you know, you always have your safe words. You can always reject a suggestion if it makes you feel unsafe or uncomfortable. But these things are happening to you instead of you're making them happen. But I think yeah. there's that like little bridge of expectation at the beginning that needs to be. And if people regarded themselves more as collaborators in a playful context and less, you know, this high pressure like you will be hypnotized, I will take your control away, which is, you know, a ballpark that I work in as a hypnodom. But we can still have fun. (laughs) We can still have a good time. Um, And I think if more people relaxed into it instead of questioning it. I know. If more people (laughs) There's a thought. Let's relax into hypnosis. Yeah. And relax. Exactly. Okay, no, you've got to stop doing that. Remember, <laughs> our goal is not to hypnotize the people who are listening to the podcast. Can I just hypnotize you then? Yeah, but I don't think anybody's going to find that really fun to listen to you hypnotizing me on a podcast. Yeah, you can talk in trance now, right? You'll be fine. Okay, you're not wrong there. However, mm-hmm. I-, I think that that would, that would lead to a very slow conversation. It'd be mostly a witty repartee from your side only, because I don't think I'm that witty and trance that's all it is already Sai. so <laughs> she does own the conversation we're not gonna lie <laughs> no Sai, come on you're wonderful please keep talking i love when you talk especially in trance i'm blushing you guys can't see but i'm blushing hey so um moving on can you share one of your favorite kinks that you enjoy with hypnosis? I know that there was a lot of talk about bimbification earlier, but what do you enjoy as one of your favorite kinks to either do as a hypnodon or as a subject? Mm, just the one. Okay, mm. well, you can go with the top three if you want, but mm, I, I feel three. like okay. that's tough. Okay, orgasm control has to be up there because that's a lot of fun with hypnosis. I mean, I liked that anyway. That was. Of that predated hypnosis and just the possibility for pleasure and for messing around with people's control over their own bodies it's really good and conditioning yeah that's really good it's really good um second one can i say sort of sadomasochism as one of them so i mean you know that is uh, that is kind of a kink that's a kink um that's true i think playing with people's kind of pain and maybe not i'm not that big of a fan of like inflicting pain with hypnosis but i like the kind of emotional sadism and i like luring people into traps that they can't get out of i guess bondage is the third one maybe which hypnosis can kind of enhance or exploit oh but i don't want to choose three humiliation embarrassment is so good um what else pet play i love transformation stuff feminine i don't want to choose i can't choose three. <laughs> well you are in the right field for being able to play with all of those things so we're not human going furniture. to tell you, you have to pick it's human furniture there you go i still remember that really the first time i i saw you doing um really interesting stuff was i think uh, was it Ihu that you did the emotion play with Sinister? Mm, shame play we did. Shame play, yes. Yeah. That was amazing to watch because at the time I had just gotten back from Charm just like six weeks earlier and Ihu came around and to watch your facial expression as everything went on and to hear the explanation of everything was just 
wow, it really opened my eyes to the possibility of what not only mind states, um, but also emotion states could be in trance, that those were really open door options, Mm -hmm. because it is just fascinating to watch. And it was really interesting to watch your facial expressions change as everything went on. I went very blushy, and then I went very Heidi. (laughs) Yeah, oh, it was good. I do love shame play. And actually, I'd say since getting... I didn't used to be all that into kind of humiliation. And then since getting into hypnosis, it's really unlocked the the humiliation slot in me. Oh my God. I didn't know I wanted to be a hue cow, but now I do. I don't know how I feel about, I mean, I do know how I feel about that. I feel like it's hot, but I also feel ashamed, but that is why it's hot. It's just hot. I'm sorry. I can't. You can't put these things back in a box. I had my first, actually, I don't think it was a vol fantasy the other day, but I did have a kind of vampirical fantasy the other day, which was about someone begging to be eaten. And I didn't know that I was into that, but I am. Apparently, I mean, there's very few. (laughs) The boundaries are very blurry these days. I don't even know where they finish now. Well, (laughs) I do, but it's like... (laughs) It's You're, it's some really it's some really fucked up shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're gonna tee him up softball style like that. I mean, we're gonna be here all day. But mm-hmm. I I absolutely can understand that. I think that the the benefit of hypnosis, the benefit of kind of accepting that, especially for me, was accepting those kinks, understanding that those mm-hmm. were things that I found really enticing, really interesting things that I didn't really take the time to to question before and hypnosis gives you the ability to do that um i will say for a fact that iq play was probably something i had never really thought about until a specific person decided to ask me the same question no names at all i'm sure (laughs) no not at all uh decided to ask me the same question in three different mind states and i specifically remember every one of them and it just there's that difference where all of a sudden your brain loses that capacity a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and to the very end you're just smiling like eh. <laughs> I remember all of those states and I feel that I'm a fairly intelligent individual so to to experience that is just it's profound to a certain extent it tells you more mm. about who you am, who you are and then also gives you the ability to appreciate that a little bit oh, I mean the stuff that you've find out from being a subject and I guess from being a hypnotist but like when you're experiencing them as a subject about your own mind and your own capacities is insane like the capacities for pleasure that hypnosis has unlocked for me I can have freaking spontaneous mental orgasms I would never have known that if I hadn't done hypnosis and literally I see myself as having a fourth way to come now wait (laughs) Third way to come. I wish I had four, right? Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> I know how many ways I can come. <laughs> Definitely three. Three. I think I'm gonna Make, have no, to... I do have four, because I can come from having my tits. What? <laughs> it's important to talk about pleasure, Sai. I'm not shaming at all. I absolutely appreciate that. I'm just realizing that I'm going to have to put a couple more tags on this. <laughs> Oh yeah, this is getting demonetized. Oh, yes, I wasn't baby. even worried about that in the first place. I'm just laughing, going, you know, in any of the other conversations, I don't think I went this far south. I should probably be like, warnings at the front, folks. Yes. I mean, you call me an instigator for a reason. That is very true, and you do it so well. Thanks. But but for real, though, hypnosis is, is amazing. Like, the bliss, the pleasure, the bodily sensation enhancement is just amazing and i work with i don't know if you know kaz riley she's a hypno well she's a hypnotist hypnotherapist she does a lot of work in kind of the sexual freedom field kind of Mm. looking at sexual enhancement and also sexual dysfunction and things like that Uh, we put a video out about hypnotic orgasms mostly aimed at um clinicians and the response that that got was incredible and there were women approaching her saying i had lost hope that i could be orgasmic and this video has made me hopeful again oh that's like, amazing isn't crazy like more people should know about this not just hypno kingsters this is for everyone uh i'm very passionate about this subject so well 
that was something that wise guy talked about was he does trainings for individuals to kind of become certified and he feels that the people that he trains or people that are really into hypno kink in general are fairly well trained and capable in comparison to your average hypno clinician not to dis- not to shame the field not to say you know anybody can't do their jobs well it's the fact that we have a passion for it that it is mm-hmm. something that to us is important it's not a job it mm-hmm. is something that we get to do something we enjoy experiencing and bringing other people to experience mm-hmm. so yeah well that's, that's why awesome. it's so amazing to have these events where these i mean the, the level of knowledge i mean i would i'm just still a baby compared to some people in the scene um who've you know, been doing this for like you know 10 15 20 plus years but the amount of knowledge that people have i mean the articles that get written and it can't compare to the academic literature because you know academia is so reduced to what mm. they are, are able to study what they're funded to study and in the ways that they study it it's so flawed in my opinion like we know as hypno kinksters, there's so many ways that people go into trance, but in a study, they get read from a script by a random, you know, researcher, or everyone gets the same script, they just get read at, and then they're classed as hypnotizable or not hypnotizable. And that's what the, you know, academic literature is working with a lot of the time. Whereas we are doing hypnosis every single freaking day of the year, baby. We're doing it with a like a crazy amount of people, people with different brains, people with different way things that they enjoy when they're being hypnotized, and we're talking, you know, iteratively to improve. And I think having a con where you can come together with all of those people with all of that information and learn so much over like a weekend is just oh, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I was just having a thought that we really should have. I, I, I always want to go to a psychology class that teaches hypnotism and, and go talk to the teacher. So what's your favorite way of dropping somebody and just have conversation back and forth to, to see more of the clinical version versus the, I'm going to call it the fun version. Mm. What are the differences between <laughs> those two? I'm sure it would be just a great conversation. I'd be taking notes. They'd be taking notes. At least I hope, but. I don't consider myself that very well practiced, but I think it would be very interesting because uh, I had the benefit when I was at Charmed of meeting an individual who actually was um, a hypnoclinician by trade. I think think I'm using the right job title. Um, Individual was just, he was fantastic. He had so much energy and it was great to hear from his perspective that he had never really done hypno kink. Before a certain point, he'd been trained in traditional hypnosis and traditional techniques, and now he was freeing his mind to open up and explore these other opportunities. Mm. I think that's awesome. I I think that this is an invaluable tool that allows you to do so much, as long as we remember that we are not, well, most of us, rephrasing that before I offend somebody else, we are not... um, classically trained we are not meant to do mental health stuff you know the the goal of what we're doing is to have fun to explore to not entertain but to understand the human mind mm-hmm. but you know we don't go in with a bag of tools trying to fix everything that we find that that just leads no to- no no but it does change you it changes how you approach conversation i think mm-hmm. a lot of the time and it changes what you believe you can do with your voice and your skills so for example um at new year I was at a party. Oh, do you remember when we could go to parties, Si? I do. Oh, were good times. With they people, were... fle- flesh people within like two meters wait, of me. Wait, wait, so real good. people exist still? I thought it was all computer screens. Uh, it does look that way, doesn't it? But no, it does. flesh people are still around. Um, but yes, a, a flesh people party at New Year. And one of my friends was having a bit of a bad time. She'd taken some, <laughs> she's taken some psychedelics and she was having one of the less good times that you can have on such substances. Me, myself, I would never do such a thing. But this friend of mine, she, she unfortunately was having a bad time. And uh, I was able to use hypnotic language and kind of what I knew about relaxing people and calming people down to help her get to a point where she felt very safe and very held and I wasn't doing you know mental health crisis work or anything like that but just that I could have this conversation with someone make them feel heard 
make their emotions kind of calm down. And actually I did it a second time when one of my friends, we'd been doing some burpees, <laughs> which is quite a hard exercise. Don't know if you've ever done a burpee. It's a, it's a lot. We were doing something, I think it was a fitness program that billed itself as like, this will give you a heart attack or something hilarious like that. I was like, this is going to be great. We were doing it. And then she started having heart problems. <laughs> and I was like, well, they build it. <laughs> yeah, they did. Uh, sat her down and then got her to think about how her body, you know, how could she relax her body using kind of pacing and leading um, to try and bridge the gap while I was calling the ambulance for her. And it, just to have those skills, these tools, for you know you can influence people with them in a negative way i guess you could use them for sales or business but you can also just you can use them for relaxing people which is the majority of what i do really is just getting people relaxed and then having fun in lots of different ways but to have those tools that you can use in a crisis that i've learned through kink do you know what i mean i've learned through having fun i've learned through my dark nefarious job is amazing. I can do that anywhere and with anyone. And that's not saying that I'm going around hypnotizing everyone that I meet, but to have those, that understanding of someone has changed my, changed my life. So it's changed my world. Well, I think that's a really valid point though. I, like you said, you're not doing emotional, or you're not using your skills in the wrong way. What you're doing is you understand the human mind better. You understand the, the mm. responses that you're getting because most of us are usually on the lookout for um, adverse reactions whenever we're working with somebody mm -hmm. in trance. You, mm. you, you're careful about things, but you also understand how the mind works. What can you do? How can you short circuit those negative thoughts? How can you encourage the positive thoughts? I think that's mm. fantastic because honestly, in kink, what's something that, you rarely ever would have heard about as an individual in non-kink aftercare the ability mm. to be a good individual after an intense situation whether that be video games sports driving sex whatever For that sure. being able to take care of the other individual to make sure that they're they feel okay that they feel valid that they're understood and that they're in a safe place and That's i mean the other side of do. things negotiation as well i mean this Absolutely. pandemic has been a perfect time to exercise your negotiation skills because there are so many risks that you have to assess and you have to communicate you have to ask if someone has the same risk profile as you you know you have to anticipate things that might happen and inform people of that and you know being a kinkster has changed how i relate to people i think i'm a lot more attentive to people's needs and to how my actions might have an effect on people than i was before this is a it's a good life skill i'm not saying everyone should be a kingster i'm just saying everyone should think like a kingster <laughs> i absolutely agree i think that the the concept of consent being in a very important part of the negotiation and consent conversation for hypnosis hell consent something that i think everybody feels is violated a lot in everyday life i feel that if everybody had the opportunity to talk in an open conversation about how they feel about something and being on the same page, it would make a huge difference in so many ways and facets. And as kinksters, that's something responsible kinksters do. We make sure mm -hmm. that both parties are on the same page, that we're in, we're capable of making a agreement, that we are both understanding of what each other wants out of the situation, and that we're both working towards that mutual end goal. You know, mm -hmm. That's 100%. an important fact. And I think... I guess talking about consent, but bringing it back to hypnosis and conventions a little bit, the complexities of consent that you start to get into and you start to unpack when it comes to not only kink, but, you know, kink that affects your beliefs and the way that you think and your thought patterns. I don't know how I'd have begun to understand that without the community there to kind of not always just tell me what to think, but ask the questions that make me sit with those concepts of consent and, and where consent might be influenced or changed in a hypnotic relationship, in a long-term hypnotic relationship, in a brainwashing relationship. And I still, you know, I have a fairly strong grasp of what I believe consent to be, but that needs to be discussed, especially in longer term, kind of more brainwashing focused relationships. Um, and I don't know where I'd have begun to understand those things without 
having kink community, hypno kink specific community to talk to about that. Do you? I just don't know where I'd start because <laughs> it's um, so specific. Prior to going to Charmed, um, that was the first real experience I had with understanding the consent model. Um, they had you do a quiz. Uh, you had to read uh, a long section, and it was, from a layman's perspective, it was difficult for me to relate from a, an understanding perspective because I didn't have a good understanding of hypnosis and how that could affect things. I didn't have an understanding of NLP, understanding of just regular language and the ability to kind of influence people. And also, I just never thought about it on a daily basis. Mm. But it's something that I incredibly value now because it is a conversation that everybody should be having more often. You should be mm. having those abilities to make sure people are okay with it. Honestly, it comes down to every aspect of our life. The, the touching of another individual, being able to talk to somebody, being just in queue at a line at a store. If somebody mm. in front of you is standing there messing on their phone and all of a sudden everybody else is moving forward, how do most of us react with that? Some people might feel the the urge to tap them on the shoulder. Some people might feel the urge to just go. <laughs> you know, some people are like, "Hey, uh, the line's moving forward. Did you know?" And it's those are many different ways that everybody can take it. But or of course, in the UK, you stand there very uncomfortably saying nothing, um, hoping that that person realizes any second, because you're not interacting with that stranger. <laughs> no way. <laughs> We all know how to cue. They will figure it out. We just have to be patient. <laughs> okay, that's the American enemy being like, mm, okay, they've got a limit of about 30 seconds before I start going, all right, <laughs> we need to have a conversation here. But you're exactly right. And it, also that idea of, you know, bimbification. What on earth does that mean to you, the person that I'm hypnotizing? Does it mean right. the same thing that I think it means before we start? Those kind of consent questions because you need to kind of have a shared understanding of what the goal is for the session together um and if you if you have the consent to do kind of whatever in that ballpark that you've agreed so you don't necessarily have to go into all the detail of everything you're going to do in trance that's fine but some people might want you to do you know or tell exactly how you're going to approach what you mean by bimbification and actually asking a subject when you say you want to be a bimbo what does that mean to you Right. You might get like 50 different responses. <sighs> so I think without the scene to guide people, because it's one thing to say, oh, you need to talk about consent, but you need to see it and hear it modeled. How do you have those conversations? Right. And I think, you know, real community exists to exhibit how to do it, not just the bullet points of, you know, make sure you ask this question, make sure you're paying attention to whether they have phobias. But actually, how do two people who are about to engage in hypnosis have that conversation? Right. And once you've seen that, you learn a thousand times more than if you just read about that you should ask about consent, because that doesn't tell you anything about how to do it. Whereas seeing people do it does, because we learn by watching. That's how humans are. And I think without things like conventions, you're it's hard to do that i agree i think that there is a lot of gaps in just reading by books and understanding there are a lot of people who make the attempt to understand to provide that conversation in a way that everybody will understand but sometimes it takes context it takes the ability to ask the question of okay i get why we would talk about phobias but what's the concern here and then the conversation becomes oh because you're worried about ab reactions. Well, what are those? And be able to relate that to somebody so they understand. That's part of making sure that everybody understands the, the, the goal of the session. But also aftercare. I mean, what does each individual person need after a very intense session? Do they need touch? Do they need no touch? Do they need a snack? Do they not need a snack? Do they need water? Do they need to just, you know, be held until they feel like they're a valid person? Any of these <laughs> things are important but you don't know about them or their specific importance until you have the ability to see it either in action or in conversation uh, that's kind of held by the community. And I guess there's that additional point of, it can feel quite lonely, can't it, if you have this particular thing that 
is almost like a need inside of you. Like for me, I know at this point, kink and hypno kink is something I need to feel happy and to feel fulfilled. And the scene and having people I can talk to about, you know, just candidly about the things I've been doing and I can ask questions about, you know, things that vanilla people can't answer and would probably be quite offended if I asked them. (laughs) Having friends in the scene has meant that I feel like I can be myself more with more people because that is part of who I am. And community events like conventions you make so many friends so quickly i made a friend at the uk recreational hypnosis convention who lives in germany and you know i went out to see her before the um, there was going to be hyde which was going to be a german um hypno convention but unfortunately was cancelled because of covid this year and you know i would i made a friend that i will maybe keep my whole life now we're in touch regularly and it's just another person in my network that i can approach with questions and have fun with and be myself with so it's, i mean you can it is about learning but it's also just about finding like-minded people isn't it finding acceptance finding that yeah. you're not the weird person that you think you are well i mean some of us are i, I, no, I was gonna say you probably my, are but so yeah, is everyone else i keep my i keep my weird flag flying but it comes down to the fact that you find people who understand can feel that same excitement for something. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is a huge difference between I've had conversations about with hypnosis with people in my life that aren't into hypno kink and explaining it to them. They're like, okay. Versus somebody else who was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. That's amazing. How did you do that? How did it make you feel? Why are you going to do that? When are you going to do it again? You know, those are, it makes you feel so much more connected and so much more energy for something that you find maybe a passion or something about yourself that you really enjoy. So Mm. why push that down? Why ignore that? Finding a community, just like anything else when it comes down to kink, just like in non-kink, you want to find a community of people that like to play board games or video Mm. games or like to do coffee or read books or just are like-minded individuals who watch the same TV show and want to do water cooler talk. These are <laughs> all things that we look for. We look for acceptance and belonging with others. True, really but I mean, when you're doing something that can be considered outside of the norm, especially, yep. I mean, it's one thing to be, I mean, I'm sure LARPers can relate, for example. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's not, but, but it's different to LARPing in that, you know, someone might say, oh, I'm a LARPer, and they might be like, okay that's a bit of a weird hobby but if you say oh i'm a hypno kingster or mm, i'm a sadist you might get people literally thinking that you're dangerous <laughs> which is not full of feel good energy you know um but unfortunately i mean fortunately i think that is changing i think right. bdsm is becoming more mainstream becoming more accepted but it was still at the point where you know having a community who understands who can keep each other safe, keep each other feeling kind of a sense of belonging is still so important. So on that topic, what do you think is kind of the hardest part of making content as a creator for other people who enjoy your work? Do you find it challenging just because there is the sheer number of kinks out there or that people are very varied in their tastes what do you find to be the most challenging aspect so i never feel um i never feel like i'm making content because i need to like hit a kink or anything i'm always making content because i want to make it and because it excites me the hardest part of my job is when i'm trying to do hypnosis when there's no one in front of me because the best part of being a a hypnodom well pro hypno kinkster i guess i don't know how to i still don't know how to describe what i do is being in front of someone having that channel of energy open between between you both seeing their reactions and feeding off their reactions and then giving more of what they want what they need what will make them feel good and what will make you feel good and having that moment where you're really like ah it's really nice so the hardest part is making content when there's no one to look at. There's no one enjoying it directly. So I'm just on my own looking at a camera and imagining that I'm hypnotizing someone. Which, you know, I hope 
people find my content quite good but I'm lucky because a lot of my content is actually made with people where even the things that are just my voice sometimes I'll be doing with a subject in front of me um or it'll be a collaboration it'll be me hypnotizing someone that's great but the hardest part is when I'm because I have uh only fans where I release every single day so I'm making content all the time um and so a lot of that is just me staring at my camera wishing that my camera would actually drop <laughs> it's, not literally because then it wouldn't record very well but, i was gonna say you know that I mean? would be a very interesting conversation all of a sudden so what'd you do today well i was hypnotizing my camera and it fell off the desk <laughs> wow i do actually have telekinesis now um so I think, you know, I have a massive respect for people whose main uh, love is making files, who can really put their soul into making kind of longer files. I don't think I'll ever be that person because I, it's just for me missing that lifeblood that is the interaction with the subject. So that's the hardest part, I would say. So, well, and it's a very valuable insight, I think, from everybody's perspective. To, you're right people who make content who put it out there all the time uh, it a lot of people are worried well what if they run out of ideas or how hard is it to come up with ideas i think that your point's 100 percent correct how is it making the content and putting yourself into it how do you feel that energy when you're not actually connected with somebody how do you do it without the ability to see your audience really mm -hmm. and that's why i mean a, a lot of the things i make so the file commissions i take now i pretty much don't really I'm not really open for commissions unless it's someone I session with, in which case I'm super up for it because I can kind of have them in my head when I'm doing the file. And then I can wait, you know, with bated breath until they let me know how they've got on with it. Um, or if I'm doing even shorter things, I usually it's something in one of my sessions that have triggered an idea in my head or it's something that I've read and I might have someone in particular that I'm thinking about when I make that thing. And usually there's someone I actually send that content to as like a kind of like, I made this for you. Enjoy. Um, a lot of my casual play partners get bombarded with my content, unfortunately, for them. Um, oh, yes. Unfortunately. Oh, what a terrible <laughs> life they lead. So, yes. Um, but the ideas are never. Well, I mean, in in, in fairness, you know, if you look at people who've been making files and content for years and years, that's amazing. Well done. You know, so, so amazing to see that constant creativity from them. I've only been doing it a year, so I should hope that I haven't run about, out of ideas yet because it's early days. This has got to see me through the rest of my life. So I can't be running out of ideas now. But I think the way to, to make sure that doesn't happen is to stay involved, you know, stay doing things in the community that make you feel good, stay inquisitive, stay reading erotica, stay with, stay with the passion that you feel for hypnosis and hypno kink. And from there, you'll get ideas. Of course, you have to, because right. it's hot. <laughs> yes, we all agree that it's hot. It's hot. All right. <laughs> can, so... you do a, can you do an impression of my accent, please? I... No. Oh. It did okay, the hot, hit... and that was about it. The, <laughs> I felt like I was mocking you. Yeah. yeah. No, we're going to stop doing that. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll just kind of ask one or two more questions. But really, what's something you always want to see of more in the community? I've asked this from a few different people um, who've been around varying amounts of time. But what's something that you enjoy seeing in the community and want to see encouraged or see more of? More women who are doing hypnosis more people of color <laughs> oh my gosh the kink community is so white <laughs> so white especially i mean in the uk my actual local community is is startlingly white um and even online you know the the majority of content creators are white and i think it would be great if that wasn't the case um i have been uh, trying to put out there that people in the uk I was just going to do it for my local area, but with lockdown, it really doesn't matter. Um, I'm giving free tuition to people of color who want to learn hypnosis. So if you're in the UK and listening to this and you're a person of color and you want to learn hypnosis, then please contact me. <laughs> I'd love That's to teach. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that would be great. But 
I guess in a more fun way, what would I like to see more of? In a completely um, self-interested place, I'd like to do more smut with people with penises. <laughs> because I keep getting people in my DMs assuming that I am gay. And I'm not. It's just I only know women who will let me hypnotize them to do things. So if you're, again, preferably in the UK, a face out person who already does smut, I would like to hear from you so I can make smut with you. <laughs> cool, folks, there you go. Both, both helping the community in one way and then a little bit of self-interest in helping the community in another way. I like the way this worked out. You know, you, you well, both, yeah, both sides. You gotta gotta take the opportunities to ask these questions while you're in a platform, I guess. Yeah. Well, and I think that's something everybody wants to see more of is the people embracing that. Um, I think that there's a lot of jokes running around the community sometimes because we'll see something in a movie or in a TV show and everybody's like, oh my God, that had to have been a hipsto king hypno kingster. Somebody had to have been. I laugh because one of my favorite little things Maybe it's just my corrupted mind seeing stuff. It was Frozen 2. There's this little moment where all of a sudden the mom does like a little kinesthetic thing to the daughter. And don't consider me a pervert for that. I just laugh because I'm watching it. All of a sudden her eyes start blinking and then she goes close. And I'm like, okay then. I don't know who what? decided this is a good thing. It's one of those things. Like Lots of people intuitively. I, I see a lot of content actually from doms who aren't hypno doms who do talk to camera type stuff and i'm like you're doing hypnosis bitch you don't know that you are but you definitely are um because their storytelling is hypnotic or you know you, you see someone you know my my nesting partner that i live with here he's not trained in hypnosis whatever that means um but when he holds me he does super kinesthetic type stuff and it you know relaxes my lovely brain box down so I think, you know, it's something that a lot of people are doing intuitively or because they've noticed that it makes them feel nice. It's just putting a, a particular word to it, isn't it? A lot of the time. But also, like you said before at another point, it's a life skill. Hypnosis, mm. the ability to communicate, the ability to understand your fellow human beings a little bit more. That's an amazing thing. That's something that everybody should take the time to understand a little bit more, whether or not mm. it's hypnotizing somebody else sometimes it's just about being able to realize i think that they're having a negative reaction to something what can i do to help and saying hey mm -hmm. i'd like to help you is that okay because hey valuable skill negotiation consent making sure that these things are said heard and just reaching out to a fellow human mm -hmm. i suppose the last thing that i would like to see more of in the community is just it's back to that point. It's kind of related to that magic point earlier. Hypnosis isn't magic. More subjects understanding that, you know, they don't actually even really need to be equipped by a hypnotist to be kept safe. They just need to be able to understand that at all times they are able to keep themselves safe. That what the person is doing to them, whether it's the first time they've done it or the thousands of times they've done it, isn't anything that they can't reject. They can always reject suggestions that make them feel unsafe or uncomfortable because everything that's happening in hypnosis is happening inside their own head. And if people understand that, then they can keep themselves from doing things that they don't really want to do. So I guess the classic, you know, you, hypnosis can't make you do anything that you don't want to do, which a lot of people are very critical of that phrase because it doesn't talk about the nuance of how people right. can be led to do something they, they don't want to do. I think that's important to criticize, but it's also important to recognize that there is truth in it, yeah. that it does all happen in people's own heads. It's just that that conversation needs to be done in a more kind of in-depth, nuanced way. And the sooner that a subject can get their head around the fact that they are able to reject suggestions they don't want to follow, and the less the myth that the hypnotist can do anything they like to them persists, the better. But equally anything that blames someone for something that they were persuaded to do that they didn't want to do in hypnosis, you know, there should never be any blame there either. It's just a balance to walk between those points. 
that's an, a great point. I think that also ties just back to the whole negotiation and understanding what both sides want out of the session, mm. making sure that everybody's on the same page. And yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Because. <laughs> I'm sorry, are we, are we about to finish? Because I was about to go on a whole metaphor about this door that I have in my living room right now. And I'm I'm not sure that should be a conversation for today unless it's time. <laughs> I, I don't I think we'll have to save that for another day. I think that would be a very interesting conversation. <laughs> and now now we have a teaser for another conversation. Everybody <laughs> wants to hear about the door in your living room and the metaphor that's tied to it. I shall have to make some content, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, that that is exactly the case. All right, folks. Yeah, we're going to talk about the door in my living room. And everybody's going to be like, oh, my God, what's that? <laughs> Alternatively, you can just cut off this bit of the interview. So it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. You know, that, that's where I get to have conversations. Um, just one last thing. I know that you had talked about it. So have you decided whether or not you're going to do something with Charm this year? Have you submitted a, a proposal? I haven't submitted yet, but I will. I think I will. Yeah. I feel pretty... I feel good. I feel good about maybe something around um, reading your subject or encouraging kind of newer dominants to talk about what they want to figure out. Because I think we kind of assumed that we should just know what we want as a dominant um, or that we should be the dominant that we've seen in media, which neither of those things are very comfortable for a lot of people. I think especially people who are socialized as women aren't necessarily taught to engage with their own desires or act as the active agent in a kind of erotic process. And I think there are there are practical steps that you can take in order to gain confidence when you're stepping into dominance in an authentic way that suits you. And I'd love to talk about that maybe. That's what I'm talking about, Equake. So I might develop it over time. Or I might come up with something new. There might be something else frittering around in this uh, very busy head by then. So we'll see. Yeah, I'll have to watch the uh, w w watch the conversation about New Dominance. It sounds like a very relatable topic. I think so, a lot of people feel that way. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they do. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. I really enjoyed getting to, to poke around in your brain and appreciated all your conversations about consent, negotiations. Such a wonderful perspective to have. And Hopefully everybody got an opportunity to learn a little bit more about you. Thank you. It's been so nice. Thank you for interviewing me, Sai. Si. Yeah. You know I always love it when people poke around in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of an evil laugh there, folks. Anyways, have a nice night. Thank you, Sai. Bye. <laughs>